Today on The John Ankerberg Show, life can be full of surprises. One day you can be feeling wonderful, and soon after the doctor may diagnose you with a life-altering disease. Accidents, weather disasters, the coronavirus, crime, disabilities can completely change our lives in a moment. When they do, people ask, where is God when life hurts so bad? Such people want to hear answers from real people who have suffered as much or more than they have. And today you will hear from two such people. Johnny Erickson Tata severed her spinal cord in a diving accident at age 17. She has been confined to a wheelchair for the last 50 years. On top of that, she has contracted breast cancer and suffers from chronic pain every day. She even was infected with the coronavirus, but thankfully recovered. Dr. Michael Easley was president of Moody Bible Institute, but he resigned when he began experiencing tremendous back pain. His misery led to painful operations, where doctors eventually took out all of his discs and fused all of the bones in his spinal column to save his life. He now is the lead pastor at another church where he lives with chronic pain every day. These two will answer the questions surrounding the topic, where is God when life hurts? We invite you to join us for this special edition of the John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me. As you've just heard, we've got two wonderful guests, Dr. Michael Easley and Johnny Erickson Tata. And our topic today is very important. Why are the disabled and those suffering from disease? Maybe we're talking about you. You might have cancer, you might have ALS, you may have a disability, you may have had a stroke, you may have something else. Why are you important to God? And how do your lives have meaning and purpose? Maybe you've given up on that idea. Some of you are listening are paralyzed like Johnny. And you're confined to a wheelchair or a bed. You may even be like my mother who could not walk or even speak when she suffered from Lou Gehrig's disease. Your mind is still sharp, but you're trapped in your body. It's deteriorating all around you and there's nothing you can do about it. Johnny? Some people also have emotional loss. Lost the baby, lost a husband, wife, somebody they loved. How can these people know that they are still important to God, that their lives still have meaning and purpose? Hmm. Well, just hearing you talking reminds me of my friend John McAlexander. Six foot three, handsome, but he was struck by a neuromuscular disease that wasted away his body. For a long time, he was able to get around in his three-wheeled scooter, motorized scooter, and visit patients in nursing homes. He had a heart to serve others, even despite his very severe disability, but the uh, disease encroached further, and there came a time where he was just so helpless, he was put in bed in the middle of his living room, hooked up to a feeding tube, and uh, barely able to talk above a whisper. Uh, when I would visit him, I always loved visiting him because just his bright, buoyant spirit was such an inspiration to me. Well, one night, um, his labored breathing was particularly difficult and he wanted to call out for help, uh, but he couldn't. His wife was upstairs and the monitor between their rooms did not pick up his faint voice. During the night, an ant found him under the covers, and then several ants, and then hundreds, and then thousands of ants, a wriggling invasion of black ants covering his body, in his nose, in his eyes, in his ears, and he desperately tried to call out, and he couldn't. And when I got the news of this, I was over in England. And when I read the email, I was stunned. And his wife said, please pray. I've never seen John so depressed. 
Well, when I came home from England, the first thing I did was go visit my friend. And his skin was still somewhat badly bitten from that nighttime invasion. But invariably, there was this indomitable twinkle in his eye. And he looked at me with a, a very weak smile and said, but I beat him, Johnny. <laughs> I beat him. I survived. I'm sorry I cannot tell that story without choking up. Because John lives on a verse like Ephesians 3, 10, which says that it is now God's intent that through the church, his manifold wisdom should be made known to the powers and the principalities in the heavenly realms. John didn't have many visitors toward the end of his life. He was sick so long that a lot of people forgot about him. He didn't hobnob with many people. He didn't rub shoulders, his testimony didn't influence a great many others, but, but his life in that bed in the middle of the living room was a shining testimony. His life was like a, a, a chalkboard upon which God was writing lessons about himself. My grace is sufficient. I will help those in need. I hear the cry of the afflicted. I will be their ever-present help in their trouble. It, it was like God was showcasing to to all the powers and principalities, not just a few somebodies on earth, but millions and millions of unseen somebodies out there that were amazed at John's loyalty. And they were no doubt thinking to themselves how, how great this person's God must be to inspire that kind of loyalty. When people are alone and suffering, and, and Michael and I know plenty of people, we are part of a um, a small pain pal group, as it were, and many of these people who suffer have been lying in bed for years, one or two, for more than a decade. And they are shut away. And like John McAlexander, they don't get many visitors. Nobody hears their strong testimony. They are alone. But I tell you what, a great many millions of somebodies are learning about how great God is as they watch His grace inspire them and sustain them and support them. I think we're talking about the spiritual world, God included, is watching them. You know, Luke 15, 10 says, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The spiritual world is watching to this battle that's going on. And if nobody else is seeing, God and the angels, good and bad, are watching what's happening. Oh my goodness, yes. And, and, and that makes the, 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 the lowliest, seemingly most insignificant believer, it makes their life a battleground upon which the mightiest forces of the universe converge in warfare. How about that? I mean, that just goes to show how high the cosmic stakes really are in terms of our trust and obedience to God. When John McAlexander died, which was some time ago, as his spirit rose to heaven, I'm sure that millions of angels stood erect to attention and saluted this saint as his spirit drifted by to reach the throne of God because he had commanded such respect, I am certain. If angels rejoice and are happy and glad about the repentance of one sinner, how much more must they rejoice when that same sinner turns saint? Trust God through the toughest of times and shows himself to be a, a valiant, brave warrior in the kingdom of Christ. I want to be there. I want to be in John McAlexander's number. I don't want to shame my Savior, stain his reputation, make him look bad by my grumbling and complaining. I want to hold fast to my confession. Uh, in an earlier program, Michael was speaking to that verse from Hebrews. Hold fast to those things that you believe in the light, because I, I want to be among that number that is honored in heaven and it all happens down here on earth. We only have a few short years to prove our faith genuine, as we're told in Scripture. I want to prove my faith genuine by not complaining, by persevering, and by following my Savior. Before we go to people being influenced by such people as John, let's follow that up with Job, the conversation that happened in heaven that Job never knew about. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah. Talk about that, Well, Michael. three times we have in Job, Job 1, 8, 1, 12, and 2, 6, where God comes to Satan, and He says, The Lord said to Satan. So the introduction of this passage is quite striking. Job's minding his own righteous business, right? Yeah. And the Lord comes to Satan. So the provocation of this is, is unnerving for us as we read it. But each time there's a little negotiation, we might say, and he lets him go a little further in the work he does on Job. Well, to God's afflict bragging him. about Job. Yep. Have you seen my good servant down here? Like John. I mean, this guy's doing yeah. a great job. And God allows it for reasons we won't know until glory. He allows that allocation of, okay, you can touch him. You can't kill him, but you can touch him. He kills his children, destroys his, his, his livelihood, turns his wife somewhat against him, we might say. There's a striking verse in Job chapter 6, verse 10. But it is still my consolation, and I rejoice in unsparing pain that I have not denied the words of the Holy One. And whether it was John or Johnny or others who struggle, it's can, can we endure this horrific horizontal life to say, I'm not going to deny God. Sure, I have questions. Sure, some people ask why. I ask how an awful lot. I'm sure Johnny asks how an awful lot. But it's, I'm not denying God. I'm, I'm a ambling, failing, sinful believer saying, how do I live this way in such a condition? And as we both tried to articulate in earlier episodes, uh, encouraging other people, seeing, seeing a field out there of other people that are hurting, that are in distress, that have no hope whatsoever. And just like Johnny, when I get out of myself and I spend conservatively 10% of my time encouraging people with constant pain, chronic pain, back issues, writing them an email, calling them on the phone, and just walking through, can I encourage you in these things and hang on to Christ, just do the next thing, don't be discouraged. All right, why? When you're experiencing great pain and your body is deteriorating all around you, why should you go on? The conventional wisdom in America today and in many places of the world is when you get to that spot, hey, just commit suicide, get out of town, that's it. Why shouldn't they, Michael? Biblically, is there still work for them to do? It may be hard to uh analyze the work. It might be hard to quantify it, but there's two passages out of Psalm 115 and 116 that, that challenge me. Or the psalmist says, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor those who go down in silence. But as for us, we will bless the Lord from this time forward and forevermore. So there's work still to do, because if, if once I'm off the scene, I'm done. Sure, people might commemorate or memorialize or say some eulogy, thing, say some nice things at a eulogy, but there, we're not going to have the same opportunity we have. And then the hinge passage to me in Psalm 116, verse 15, where the psalmist says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. And that put, put those two together. We don't have the right to say this is the time, but when it is the time, it's precious to God. He cares about it. I was at a funeral uh, for my mentor a few years ago, John, and we had a private graveside before the large memorial. And this dear friend of his uh, read from Deuteronomy 34 where Christ came down and buried Moses in a place that no one knows. And he made an observation I had never heard. He said, uh, there's dignity in the death of a servant. And that Jesus came down to bury his servant Moses, a unique servant. And so I put these together. There's a time, there's a place for it. It's not ours to make that decision. And it's precious to God when that godly person moves from this life to the next. As hard as it is to embrace, we have imperceptible influence being the man, the woman God wants us to be, no matter what our circumstances are, uh, just by being faithful, just by choosing to say, I'm going to do the next thing. I'm going to get going today. I'm going to pray for those in my way. I'm going to pray for God to give me enough grace and mercy to, to press on. And I don't think we have the right uh, to make a decision outside of God's timeline. Yeah. You've got a great story of one of your friends that wanted to commit suicide and get out of town. And you talked her out of it. Tell me the story. Well, she was a woman I met at one of our Johnny and Friends family retreats. We run these retreats for special needs families and Carla Larson had signed up to come 
and I was reading through her registration information, and I saw that, oh my goodness, here's a woman who's a double amputee. She's had three heart attacks. She has one kidney. She suffers from severe uh, edema, constant angioplasties, legally blind. She's recently lost uh, two more fingers. And uh, I thought to myself, I've got to go meet this woman quick. So I hunted her up on campus. And I said, Carla, I'm so glad you came. To which she replied, well, I thought I'd better attend a family retreat before I lost any more body parts. <laughs> I thought that was so, she had not lost her sense of humor. But here she was in her wheelchair, uh, and I could see the stumps uh, underneath her shorts. She wasn't wearing prosthetic legs. She was wearing the, the bare metallic kind, and her fingers were still banded. She had three fingers on one hand, uh, two on the other. And she said to me, holding up her bandaged hands and gesturing to her, legless limbs. Why should I go on? God's going to take me home soon anyway. Why not a little sooner? This Johnny is so hard to deal with. Convince me why I should stay. And I said to her, Carla, I want you to open up my Bible and read something, which she thought was funny because here I'm asking a woman with hardly any fingers to open a Bible. But I reminded her that I'm in a condition worse than she is. <laughs> my fingers don't work at all. So she reached for my Bible, which was wedged between my leg and my wheelchair. I said, open up to Philippians chapter one and just read to me starting at the 21st verse. And so she started, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, see that Johnny, to die is gain. It's good for me to go to be with the Lord. I said, keep, keep reading. Okay, so she continued. <laughs> For if I am to stay in the flesh, it will mean fruitful labor for me. But yet, what can I say? How can I choose? I am torn between the two. For I desire to depart and be with Christ, which would be better by far. And then she read, but it is more necessary for you that I remain. I said, Carla, stop. Read that last part again, because it is more necessary for others that you remain. You've got your wound care nurses back at the clinic who don't know Jesus. And your suffering is pretty awful, but it can't hold a candle to the suffering that they're gonna experience in an eternity without Christ. You told me about several relatives who do not know Jesus. You told me about your old basketball buddies from college who do not know Jesus. You told me about the, the other people at the, at the hospital who respect you, who admire you, who love you, all of your friends have such respect for you, Carla. Can't you stay on earth a little while longer for their behalf? Think of them. Philippians chapter two, verse four. Uh, do not think of your own interest, but look out for the interest of others. What, what greater interest is there than to look out for somebody else's eternal estate? Carla, don't put yourself in an early grave. Stick with it, persevere because there are many more people who believe it is far more necessary for them that you remain. I think that's one of the best verses for people to continue to persevere, to get outside your own self-centered shell and realize that your perseverance, your endurance by the grace of God can have a life-changing impact on others who are watching, others who are skeptics, who are cynics. When they see your endurance, which is upheld by the grace of God, it will cause them to think twice about the Lord that you trust. And that's a good reason for sticking with it. Yeah, Michael, she says there's four reasons we ought to stick around. For ourselves, maybe God wants to show us something more. For our family, friends, strangers. For the glory of God, what matters to Him. And for the heavenly hosts watching, Let's zero in on this thing of the family. When people come to the end, it's important that they realize they can have a great impact on the kids, grandkids, their own sons and daughters, friends that are around them. Talk about that a little bit. Um, there's something about those final words that mean the world to us. And all the four things you've enumerated, John, I just, I go back to that imperceptible influence. We have no idea 
how powerful and potent. The other thing is, I think most of us, as we age, hopefully we're gaining in wisdom and we're also a little more gentle than we were perhaps in our youth and vigor. And we look at people with other problems differently and we're able to have more compassion on our kids, more compassion on difficult relationships and to love them for Christ's sake. And that might just be the turning letter, the turning point that helps them say, even in this person's pain, even in their illness, they still minister to me. To both of you, how can you encourage people to keep their spirits up when they get to that position where everything is deteriorating? Well, I, I think the best thing to do is to rally around yourself people who will pray for you. Um, we wrestle not against the flesh and blood of chronic pain. We don't wrestle against the flesh and blood of quadriplegia or spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis or osteogenesis imperfecta or Lou Gehrig's disease or Alzheimer's or autism. We wrestle against powers and principalities in the heavenly realms who would love nothing more than to keep us defeated in discouragement and oppression. So tear down these strongholds of discouragement by asking a few close Christian friends to pray for you. And if you don't have Christian friends, contact a church near you and ask to be put in touch with their prayer group and confess your need to others who will pray for you because prayer changes hearts. Prayer can even change your perspective. Prayer can chase away depression, but it begins by reaching out. Again, as I said in an earlier program, um, no one should suffer alone. It's why God created spiritual community. So reach out for help and ask for help. Yeah, I love the story that you were telling about the lady that's been confined to her bed for over 10 years in a corner where she can't even see the stars. Yes. And she says she gets joy over praying for you. Absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small group, 35 other sufferers of pain, chronic pain. And uh, this woman, Rika Theron, she lives in South Africa, has been in bed for over 10 years. And I remember I emailed her once and I said, oh, I, I hope you can see the stars tonight over on your side of the earth. She lives in, like I said, South Africa. And she said, oh, Johnny, she emailed me back. I, I haven't seen the stars in many years. My bed is in a corner of a room where I cannot see them, but I know they're up there. And that makes me, that makes me content. And, and she confesses that it's, it's her great joy to pray for Michael, for me, for all of us in this pain pal group. If she's gonna intercede for me, I'm gonna step up to the plate and do everything from my end to get actively engaged in whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do in my life. All right, next week I wanna ask both of you this question. How do you keep from going back into to depression when you experience constant setbacks like pneumonia, breast cancer, and more and more severe pain. It just keeps coming at you like a freight train and it doesn't stop, it's not gonna stop. You've had these periods of depression. I want you to advise the folks, what do they do when they experience the same things that you are experiencing? I hope you'll join us next week. Everyone knows someone who is suffering today. Listening to Johnny and Michael, I realized I have never heard anybody give more practical information about God, pain, and suffering than what these two have said today. And if you would like to have all of the information in our series, Where is God When Life Hurts? All five programs are available on DVD for a gift of $49. Or, you may go to our website at jashow.org and right now download a digital copy of this series for a gift of $25 today. In this series, Johnny and Michael answer many questions including, if the life-altering disability or illness that I have now is what I'm going to live with for the rest of my life, how can I trust God with my future? Why did I get the coronavirus? How can I continue to believe God is good and loving when I am experiencing such prolonged pain? Is it really God's will to heal everyone who prays in faith? Where does scripture teach that no matter what your condition, 
you are still important to God. And how can God help when I face constant setbacks? All five programs in Where Is God When Life Hurts are available on both Blu-ray and DVD for a gift of $49. And you may order this series now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or you may go to our website at jashow.org. That's jashow.org and order them as a digital download for $25. Then second, we are making available our series entitled, God's Help When You Suffer, for a gift of $39 on DVD or as a digital download for $15. Or third, you may wish to order our series, God's Encouragement for Caregivers, which is on DVD for a gift of $39, or as a digital download for $15. Johnny's husband, Ken, and Michael's wife, Cindy, participated in this series. And finally, all three of these series together are available in a very special package on DVD for a gift of $99, or as a digital download at our website at jashow.org for only $55. And if you wish to order all 11 programs for a gift of $99, a generous donor will also provide a micro SD card that will be sent in your name to someone overseas who does not have a Bible. They can insert the micro SD card into any cell phone, even if they are not connected to the internet and it will immediately let them hear the whole New Testament in their own language. To order these three series and provide a micro SD card for someone overseas, please call us at 1-800-805-3030. Or you may call that same number any day this week, 24 hours a day. You may also order the DVDs or digital downloads at our website, at jashow.org, where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. And those of you who live in Canada may order the DVDs or digital downloads by calling us at 1-866-746-5803. And our Canadian website is jashow.ca. And when we receive your gift, we'll send you a receipt and a personal thank you. Our goal today is to present the evidence for the gospel, lead people into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and to encourage Christians in their walk with the Lord. This program is sponsored by the John Ankerberg Show Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.